Today on Tricro Studios, we talk about five things that I wish I had known about Gibson guitars. Now I own 25 different Gibson guitars right now. I don't think this is going to be a Gibson bashing video. Uh, however, there's some things out there that, you know what, if you're looking to buy a Gibson guitar, um, maybe you should know about, first and foremost. All right, so number one is nitrocellulose finish. Um, so this is a gloss nitro guitar, and this is a satin nitro guitar. There aren't any Gibsons, at least currently, that have poly finish or anything other than these two finishes on them. Uh, what does that mean? Well, with the gloss nitro finish, if there is a lot of uh, nitro applied to it, like a thicker layer, um, after you're playing for a while, I find sometimes, like with this guitar here, it's a 2000 Gibson, um, after like an hour or so, um, my hand starts to really sweat and that you get like a weird gunky feeling on the back of the neck you can wipe that off and then keep playing and it doesn't come into play for like another hour or so. Um, but if there's a thinner layer of gloss nitro to it, which a lot of the newer Gibsons, they have a thinner layer, it's not like a crazy coat on it, um, that's not as prevalent and honestly you probably wouldn't start feeling that until a couple of hours of play. The satin nitro finish does not actually have that, at least I have not, maybe I haven't played this guitar long enough. Uh, maybe like five, six hours in, uh, there might be a little bit of gunk, but it, I have not experienced that on the satin nitro finishes. All of that being said, there is nothing that has more nitro finish, gloss nitro finish, uh, than this Fender American Original 60 Thin Line Telecaster. 20 minutes in and I'm feeling gunk. I can almost feel gunk right now. Number two multiple eras with varying quality control. So uh, one thing that I've always heard, and like I've been playing for almost 30 years now, uh, one thing that I've always heard is you really need to try out a Gibson before buying it. Uh, I've heard that with Fender and Paul Reed Smith too, um, but not as much as I've heard as Gibson because there's always good ones out there and there's always bad ones out there. Uh, I definitely have to say that I did have a few bad ones back in the day. Uh, of the 25 that I own now, I don't think there's actually one that I would consider bad. Um, but throughout the different years and different ownership, uh, there's definitely been a slip in quality control. Um, and a lot of that is definitely blown out of proportion. But I can understand why, because you're spending a lot on an instrument, uh, so you're, you scrutinize that instrument a little more than normal. And there's definitely, like I said, have been bad Gibsons out there. But uh, I do find the current ownership uh, or leadership has kind of turned that around quite a bit. Um, but I, again, that's through my experiences only, because I've heard here and there of like Finnish issues or like a, an issue with a neck or so. Number three, different levels of guitars. Now, what I mean by that is, um, if you're like me in like 2007, um, I knew I wanted a Gibson Les Paul because uh, I had a Gibson SG and uh, two Gibson Explorers and two Flying Vs and a Firebird. Um, I wanted a Gibson Les Paul, so I bought a Gibson Les Paul Studio. That guitar there, uh, that was one of the guitars that I had an issue with, uh, wasn't very happy with it, and uh, definitely had a lot of lacquer to it. Um, so did the uh, Flying V and the Explorers. Um, but I didn't really know that there were varying levels of Les Pauls. Uh, I don't know how I didn't know that, but... Um, so here we go, this is a standard 60s and a tribute. So this is a lower end model compared to the standard 60s. This currently has five strings, this currently has six. Go figure. Um, but certain, there's a little more detail that can be um, 
brought into the different guitars, just with certain things like uh, there's more attention to detail because of binding and, and certain things like that. The amount of nitro can differ as well um, from one model to another, at least they used to back then. Um, so there's certain things that, you know, you do really want to do your research with um, before buying a Gibson to make sure that, you know, you're not just going out and buying a Gibson Les Paul, you're going and buying that right Gibson Les Paul that suits you. One of the biggest things for Les Paul would be weights, like weight relief and stuff like that. So really pay attention to those. Number four, the specs do not necessarily stay the same throughout like year after year. Um, I know the new ownership is kind of trying to regulate that. Uh, so you're not, you know, kind of automatically looking up what kind of weight relief and what kind of neck and everything are on each guitar. Um, best example of that is the Les Paul Classic. So this is a, what is it, 2018? You can see, 2018 Gibson Les Paul Classic. There's no weight relief whatsoever, and it has P90 pickups. This is a 2020. Horrible, I gotta check. 2020 Gibson Les Paul Classic. It has the nine hole weight relief, um, and of course, humbuckers. This also has the four push pulls to it. Um, I had a couple of people talk about uh, how the classic has always been the more modern guitar with the push pulls and locking tuners, even though this does not have locking tuners, um, and, and that it's you know kind of always been the same. However, the Les Paul Classic, at one point in time, um, was actually had the same specs as the current iteration of the standard. So, um, and it did not have any push pulls whatsoever. The classic to me has always been nine hole weight relief and no real frills because it's classic Les Paul. Number five, the love and the hate are very, very strong. Gibson, of course, being um, a more expensive brand, um, it's, it's easy for them to be targeted for certain things. It's easy also for um, ownership to kind of let things slip and have a bad QC at certain points. And you know, you do have to look out for the good ones. Um, so those sort of things, they really ignite a lot of passion for either, you know, you have good guitars. I have 25 good, great Gibsons. Um, so I, I'm very favorable to them. I'm very happy with the product that I have. I did have, back in around 2007, what I would consider, uh, I had eight or nine Gibsons and about six of them were not favorable. Uh, they had a lot of nitro finish on them. So like, you know, you'd play for about 45 minutes and then you'd have to wipe down the neck. Um, there were some issues with the nuts and the Cluson tuners at that point uh, weren't the greatest. Um, so for years, because I get rid, I got rid of those guitars. Uh, for years, I had an unfavorable opinion on Gibson. So I loved them, then I hated them, and now I love them again. So it's easy when you're spending a lot of money on something to scrutinize it a little more than normal. And whenever there's something negative about something, you kind of tend to focus on that rather than the positive. So if you actually look at things, the overall um, experience with Gibson guitars is generally favorable. However, those who complain the most are more vocal about their complaints. And it's definitely a very popular to take something that's expensive and tell people that it's junk. And it's very popular to say that the least expensive, so like Epiphone or Squad, whatever, um, are, are better or w more well-crafted, I guess you would say, than their more expensive counterpart. That's kind of, that's always what you see. There's a lot of YouTubers out there that will kind of make comparison, I've done it in the past, uh, make comparison videos with 
inexpensive things and expensive things just to kind of bait those type of comments out. Um, so bottom line is um, play it before you buy it. See if you bond with that guitar. And you know what? If you like it and people hate it, it doesn't matter what you actually think is more important than what other people think. All right, so there you go. There are five things I wish I had known about Gibson guitars. We'll say like 2006, 2007, before I bought a whole bunch of them. Um, would it have stopped me from buying them? It m might have stopped me from buying a Firebird Studio as opposed to this guy right here, which is a Firebird, a real Firebird, I guess you would say, or a standard Firebird. Uh, and it would have made me spend a little more money on a Les Paul uh, as opposed to getting the studio version. Um, cause I do have a couple of guitars from around that era and the, if I would have spent a little more money, I would have been a little more happier, um, with the product that I had gotten. So, I don't know, take it for what you will. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's definitely better lists out there, but, uh, I'm sorry I didn't bash Gibson the whole video, cause that's, that's really what people are going to click on this for. Thanks for watching.